uh, find 2 Samuel chapter 7. Thank you, Aubrey and Jamie and all those who sing and, and play. And uh, over the last few weeks, we have been going uh, through a series over uh, what does God want for us. And it's something that, uh, as I have said the very first week, that if you have never asked yourself, what does God want from me, uh, that is a very scary thought. Uh, because all saved people who have the Holy Spirit living within them, uh, He is going to convict us and deal with us and lead us and guide us. And so if there is no desire to please God at all, uh, there is uh, a very big problem there. And so as we've been looking at this, hopefully you have been asking yourself more, what does God want for me as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a grandparent? Uh, and today as we come to the fourth part in this, and we finish up this chapter, uh, today we're looking at what being thankful looks like. Because all of us usually, uh, at, at some point, whether it's before we eat, or when we're talking to someone, would say that we are blessed. Now, not all of us have everything that we want, and not all of us have a perfect life. We all have things that we wish were different or that we could change. Maybe your health is not what you wish it was, or maybe there's a relationship that is not where you wish it was, or something else in your life. But if we're honest today, all of us have things to be thankful for. Uh, and what we hear all the time is, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. Um, but what I have realized is, just because someone says they're thankful for something, uh, I think that the, what we think about thankfulness and how we live are two different things. I've had people who say, Jake, I, I love you, and I, I think the world of you. And, and when I, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't think you understand what it means to love someone. Uh, you don't back the bus over them after you have ran over them uh, on multiple occasions. And so today, I want to talk to you about what does it really mean to be thankful and to live it out. Because most of us have been in church long enough to know that we're supposed to be thankful. We would even say that we're thankful. But the longer I pastor, the more I see that when you're thankful for something and you are blessed, it should change the way that you live. It should change the way that you view things. And so if I'm going to say that I love God, Jesus summed it up by saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. You would say, well, I love my family. I would challenge you today to say, do you really love them? Look at the evidence. If you love your church, look at the evidence. If you love your country, look at the evidence. Just because you say that you love something or are thankful for something doesn't mean that that's the truth. Literally, we're watching our country tear itself apart. And people would say, well, I love my country. I love my God. I love my family. I'm thankful for all of these things. But this morning, I want to challenge you to really look at what it means to be thankful. And so we've been looking here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 about David. David wanted to build a temple for God. God said, you're not going to build the temple for me, but I'm going to do something for you that's greater than a temple. I'm going to build you a dynasty. I'm going to build you a family. I'm going to bring an offspring that we know was Jesus that's going to bless the whole world. And so we are going to look today at David's response to hearing that message. And we looked just a little bit at it last week as we finished up our sermon. And so this morning, my challenge to you, with all that is going on in the world and all that is going on in our country and all that is going on in our life, that God wants you to be thankful. God wants you to be blessed and to realize it and how to live that out. And so if you would pray with me, and we'll just go right through God's word this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that on a day like today, God, I'm thankful that your word is sufficient, that it is, Lord, everything that we need. God, I pray that you would lead me to say the things that you want me to say. God, that you would help me to preach your word with boldness, Lord, with 
truth and love, God, knowing that it will not return void. And so, Father, I just pray today that you would work and move all for your glory. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I just want us to go through this this morning, verse by verse, because today when you leave here, you will probably leave here saying, I am thankful or I am angry. And today I want you to show that God's Word is the one talking to us today. It's not a man. It's not a, an idea. It is the Word of God. So starting in verse 18, if you would look with me. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? I wanted to start right there, but I want you to, if you're taking notes this morning, to write this down. The number one way that you live out thankfulness, that you go from just saying you are thankful to truly living out a life of thankfulness, is we must remain humble. We must remain humble. Look there in that verse 18 again. Then came King David went in and sat before the Lord. He didn't come in boldly. He didn't come in boastfully. He came in and just sat down. He got himself down before the Lord. He humbled himself in a position of, God, I want to hear from you. That is something we don't think about a lot, but when you are trying to defend yourself or when you are going into a fight or you are going into a sporting event, you prepare yourself, right? You get a good base, you get a good foundation. I'm going to take this as it comes. But when you sit down, you're pretty much defenseless. Hope I didn't just rip my pants. But anyway, (laughs) you can't fight from your backside. All you can pretty much do is take what is coming your direction. You are sitting here listening for what comes next. Expecting what comes next. Okay, we're all right. Uh, (laughs) That's what David did. David came in with this mentality. God, I want to hear from you. God, I want to hear what you have to say to me. God, I want to thank you for what you have done for me. And most of us are so busy patting ourselves on the back, bragging about what we have done, trying to tell the world and God our opinions and our thoughts and our feelings that we have not brought ourselves to a place where God, here I am, speak to me. Over the last two days, I have seen more people Say, I don't care what the Bible says, or what your religion says, or what you think, or I feel, or I think, or I've experienced. And this morning, I want you to hear this as humbly and as kindly as I can. When you stand before God someday, and every single one of us will stand before God someday, you will have nothing to say except listening to what He has to say. And so as you live your life, live your life with this simple principle that when I stand before God someday and I give account, my opinions, my feelings, my experiences, my thoughts will mean nothing. I will stand and hear from the all-powerful, all-knowing God who rules the universe. And what I want for my life is to say, God, here I am with nothing to offer. God, here I am with nothing to give, but God, I am so thankful that you loved me, that you died for me, that you've cared for me, and God, everything I have is because of you. And that's how David starts this out. And this morning as we go on, it says that my house, in verse 18, that you have brought me this far, and yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, And you have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? So he comes and he sits before God. He is going to be praying to God. He is going to hear from God. And what he starts out by saying is, God, everything you've done in my life. And if you remember, God has done amazing things in David's life. He allowed him to kill Goliath. He allowed him to go from a shepherd boy to a fierce warrior. He had delivered him from 
King Saul and his enemies. He had given him victory over uh, all of his enemies. He had raised him up. And so from David's account, David sit here, is sitting here today being more blessed than almost any human that has ever lived. Everything he has wanted, everything he has desired, God has given it to him. For most of us, we would say, wow, it is so amazing. But what David says is, it's just a small thing for you, God. It's not meaning that it's insignificant. What he is saying is that it was not a great big deal for the power of God. And you and I need to remember something. Our problems and our burdens and our situations that we're facing to us seem like the world revolves around them. That the whole universe is focused in on them. And God is wanting you to know that the problems that we face, the problems that are before us, are just a small Thing. The power of God is enough to, keep, to heal. The power of God is enough to work. The power of God is enough to restore. The power of God is enough to save. The power of God is enough. And we as God's people, we huddle in fear and discouragement. We hide our beliefs in what God's word says because we're afraid of the opposition. And today God's people need to get back to believing that whatever we're asking for, whatever we're hoping for, whatever we're dreaming for is just a small thing in comparison to the power and majesty of the God that we serve. That's all right. Some of you don't get it, but that's okay. This morning, you need to know that because the same God who hung the stars in the sky and created everything and spoke the world into existence is the same God who you can sit before. He's the same God that you can pray to. And David just begins to say, God, you, you, you're amazing. God, everything you've done is amazing. But it's just a small thing. Compared to what you could do. Look what goes on in verse 20. And says now what more can David say to you. For you Lord God know your servant. For your word's sake. And according to your own heart. You have done all these great things. To make your servant know them. Therefore you are great O Lord God. For there is none like you. Nor is there any God besides you. According to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like you, your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land, before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. David does a couple things here. He recognizes that God is God. And friends, you will never experience what God has for you until you remove your pride of thinking that you're in charge. That thinking that the world revolves around you. That you're the answer to everyone's problem. No, David says, God, you alone are God. God, you alone are the one that is worthy to be worshipped and praised and honored. And this morning I want to say this, and I hope that you will hear it in the love and humility that I can say it. This morning I do not care what people burning down buildings say. I don't care what the pundits on Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, I don't even care what your Facebook page says. I don't care. What I do care is that I recognize the God that I serve and the blessings that he gives and the power that he has and for the fact that God's people have prayed and 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 prayed prayed for God to end the genocide of our generation. He has. And this morning, I am not here today to try to offend anyone or hurt anyone. But what the Bible says about the murder of unborn children is unapologetic. 
I have served on the board of the Baptist Children's Home. I know the stories. I've seen the people. I understand the situations. But there is one thing that God says. That to take a life of an unborn child is murder. And for us as God's people to stand by and watch the holocaust of our life. Friends, we will be judged. And so I believe the blessing of God will far outweigh anything else. Why? Because what God says is truly all that matters. What God wants is truly all that matters. You say, Jake, that is cold. That is indifferent. I am going to be like David this morning. I am going to come before God knowing what he has done and that it is a small thing even though I never thought it would happen. I didn't think it could happen. I don't know what's going to happen now but I am not going to think that it was us but I am definitely going to recognize who it was and it was him. And this morning, if you and I do not get back to that point, you say, Jake, we're going to lose people after this sermon. I can't help that. Jake, there's going to be people that are going to put it on Facebook. I can't help that. There are going to be people that don't like you anymore. Trust me, that's not an issue. People like me when I do, don't do anything it seems like or do. But this morning what I want is I want God to begin to start here but not end here. I want God to continue to work and to continue to move and continue to bless. And it's not going to happen until you and I, when God does something amazing, God does something miraculous, God does something for His glory that we don't say, that's you. God, that's you. You have done that. You say, well, Jake, I can't believe you're waiting in there. Come on now. It's just what's here. Months ago, years ago, when we started this book, this is where we were for this summer, this Sunday. But he goes on and says, you have blessed our nation. He is talking about the nation of Israel. He says, God, you've been good to us. And that's the second thing I want you to know. If you really want to be humble... You don't worry about just God's blessings for you. You worry about God's blessings for the people that you love as well. That's what David says. David says, I love these people, but God, not as much as you love them. God, these are the people that I lead. These are the people that I care about. But God, you have done this and been good to them. As a pastor, I want God to bless my family. I want God to bless my marriage. And I want that more than I want anything else. But I want God to bless you as well. Why? Because I have been given the privilege of being your pastor. Being the under shepherd that God has sent for this time to this church. And so I want God to bless. As an American, I want God to bless this country. And you say, well, Jake, the economy and the president and all those things, look up here. God needs none of it. God can bless in spite of all of it. But what the Bible says is that God honors the nation that loves and honors him. And this morning, I want that for me. I want that for you. I want that for the person living down the street for me. But friends, it's only going to be when we humble ourselves and recognize the blessing of God. There's two verses I want to share with you about humility. Colossians, the third chapter, verse 12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, Kindness, humility, meekness, and song suffering. If you want to know if you're a child of God, are these attributes in your life? Are you a person of kindness and mercy, but humility? Are you willing to stand here today and say, Lord, I have nothing, but God, you have given me everything. God, I had nothing to offer you, but yet you came and died for me. You say you cannot be born again until you first recognize that you have nothing. That you are a sinner in need of being saved. This quote that I have read this week over and over again. Biblical humility is not only necessary to enter the kingdom. It is necessary to be great in the kingdom. You see friends, unless you and I will humble ourselves, we cannot be a child of God. 
You say, Jake, I, I, I'm pretty good. I, I've got it all figured out. I've got lots of money. I've got lots of wealth. I've got all these things. God says, you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You say, well, Jake, I know that I'm saved, but God's not using me. God's not working in my life. God's not helping me to make a difference for his kingdom. Do you know why? Pride. Because God will not give you something knowing that it will destroy you. God will not allow you to have a blessing just for you to ruin it. And so that's why the Bible says if you will be faithful in a little. If you will be faithful in, the Bible says, manna, money, excuse me. The, the money is the most insignificant thing in the kingdom of heaven. Even though we think it is the most significant. It's insignificant because God owns it all anyway. And so most of us, we won't manage God's material blessings His way. He is not going to give us spiritual blessings. Proverbs 22 verse 4 says it like this. By humility and fear and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. If you want to know why you do not feel like God is blessing you, it is pride. Look what it says there. By humility and the fear of the Lord. When people say things like, well, I don't care what God can do to me. I'll stand before God someday and tell him what I think of him. I don't care what this book says. I'll live my life however I want. Friends, they have removed the opportunity to be blessed by God. And friends, as a church, I do not know what is coming next. I don't know what will be said next. But I can tell you this. If this church will humble itself and fear God. That means reverence Him and honor Him and love Him and follow Him. He will pour out His riches and blessings, period. doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. God can bless His church and God can bless your family. God can bless your marriage. But it says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. It says if you want the second part, you've got to do the first part. If you want to be saved, you have to repent. That means you have to turn from where you're going to who can save you. As a believer, you have to turn from the stubbornness and the difficulty. You have to harden not your heart, the Bible says. But what is the second thing we see in this text this morning? If we're really going to be thankful, not only must we be humble, we must give God the credit. You say, wait a second, Jake, those are the same thing. They're not. Being humble means you recognize it's not you. Giving God the credit is who you are pointing to. And I think this is the thing that worries me the most anymore. Is even when people act like they're humble, many times they're not. Friends, you can talk humble, and you can look humble, and you can fake humble for a season. But when you really know you're humble, when you really know that God has done something in your life, is when you should get the credit for something, and you don't, and it doesn't bother you anymore. You say, well, wait a second, Jake. You just said we can't take the credit for anything. I understand that, but God uses people. It's like if Moses had stood there and said to the water to part and he gets across and everybody's like, man, Joshua did a good job, didn't he? Moses was standing there with the staff, but Joshua was the one that was, was walking with us and talking with us or whatever. It's in those moments that you realize really how humble you are. Or when someone tells a story about when you were saved <laughs> and the preacher's like, well, that wasn't that guy that led him to the Lord, it was me. It don't matter if it was you or not. Well, I remember being in vacation Bible school. So-and-so was my favorite teacher. And you're sitting there thinking, wait, so-and-so never taught you. I did. And in that moment, you're like, oh, how could they forget me? How could they not know it was me? Friends, in those moments when you recognize we're all on the same team and it does not matter who gets the credit. Because look what it says here in verse 25. David begins to just point to who God is and how he has worked. Now, O Lord God, 
the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house. Establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant, David, be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer. And now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true. And you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. You see, David says, God, this is all because of you and what you've done. And I'm just here to thank you and to ask you to fulfill your promise. And this morning, my greatest piece of advice for you would be this. Believe what God has said. Believe what God has said. You say, Jake, I just don't know if I can. I can promise you that when you and I stand before God someday, this book will still be true. After God has destroyed his enemies, established his eternal kingdom, as we have seen the new heavens and the new earth, friends, this word will still be true. Why? Because John, the first chapter, tells us that the Word became flesh. And friends, the Word of God talks about who Jesus is. From the beginning to the end, this book is about Jesus. What He has done, what He is going to do, who He is. And friends, offer all of eternity the promises that God has made. And this book will stand firm. And so friends... Elections change the politicians that we support. Elections change the laws that are made. But friends, the things of God will never change. That's why the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when you and I begin to pray, when we begin to try to raise our children... When we begin to try to be the people that God wants us to be, the world says it's not worth it. The world says that God cannot bless you more than what you are giving up. But friends, I am telling you this morning, not on my word, not on my authority, not on my experiences, but that the Bible says that God is faithful. And friends, whatever you entrust in him, he is able to keep it. And he is able to multiply it. And he is able to bless and work more exceedingly good than you can ever imagine. You say, Jake, I just want enough to survive. That might be what God has in store for you financially. But it is not spiritually. I believe that with all my heart. That the spiritual blessings that God wants to give us are more than we could ever ask for, ever imagine, ever dream of. But most of us have decided that God is not able. And so there's two things I want to show you from this about giving God credit. The first is you give him credit through your mouth, through worshiping him. That's what we're called to do, to worship God. That's what you should have been doing while you were here this morning during the song service. Not just singing words, not just critiquing the instrument players, not just questioning the song selection. But you should have came in thinking, I am going to focus on Jesus. I am going to focus on the one who died for me. I'm going to focus on the one who loves me. I'm going to think, be focusing on him who loved me when no one else could love me. First Chronicles describes it like this. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. You see, we have brought God to our level. We've tried in our way of viewing him. That's why people say things like, well, when I stand before God, or when I, when I tell him what I really think, 
You don't have to tell God what you really think. He already knows it. And this morning, you might be sitting on these pews, and you're sitting here. Oh, I've got to be careful sitting down. This is going to go bad. You're sitting here this morning, and you're nodding your head. Oh, preacher, just, you're just doing a real good job this morning. Doesn't happen very often, but you're doing a real good job. But deep down, you've got emotions in your heart. I just can't even believe I'm here this morning. I knew it would be something about this, this Supreme Court ruling. Or, or I, I just can't believe I'm here this morning. You know how much stuff I got to do at home? Or I can't believe I'm even sitting here. You know how many mistakes and faults Jake's has? Or, I can't even believe I'm sitting here today. I'm just so broken. I don't even know if I even believe in God anymore. Friends, you can fool us. And I can fool you. But you cannot fool God. God knows. If you're sitting here today and you're saying, Jake, I, 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 I want to believe, but I just can't. Or, Jake, I'm trying to live for God, but I just keep failing. Keep worshiping Him. You just keep singing His praises. You just keep giving Him the glory. And the second part of giving God credit is not just what you say. It's how you live. It's how you live. Psalms 103, verse 17, and I will be closing says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. You say, wow, that's a great verse. That's one part of it. Don't Joel Osteen it. Don't ch chop the good stuff out without the bad. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Don't miss that. God says that he is merciful forever. And you can have it. You're like, man, I want it. And this is how he says you can have it. Don't miss this. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. On those who fear Him. Friends, there will be people over the next days and weeks and months that will say things, I'm a Christian, but... Or I'm a Christian, but I think that the church is wrong. Or I'm a Christian, but I don't agree with. Friends, I want you to hear this this morning. That's not how it works. If you want the mercy of God, you've got to recognize that he's God, even when you don't like it. Even when it doesn't agree with your personal beliefs. Even when he shows you that you're sin. The Bible says that gluttony is a sin. Now, I know you don't preach that in Baptist churches because we have gluttoned it up for years. But I am trying my best not to overindulge in not just food, but lots of things. Why? Because God says I shouldn't. It's got nothing to do with the fact that I love my children. I do love my children, and I love my wife. I, I, I want to be healthy for them, and, and I want to live as long as I can to pick on my wife and make her miserable. No, that's just a joke. And some of you are thinking, no, it ain't. But... Uh, but why I care about it more than anything is because that's what God said. I don't like it. Trust me, when I sit down at the Dairy Queen and I ask for fries, and they're like, Jake, that's not on your diet. And I'm like, okay, then I want the little salad. I want the lettuce. I want the eight pieces of lettuce that you give instead of French fries. And they say, that'll be a dollar, an extra dollar and 30 cents. I'm like, what? You take the French fries away from me at the Dairy Queen. And you add eight pieces of lettuce and a carrot that's cut up. And you want to add a dollar and fifty cents. No, 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 I can't do that. I already couldn't eat bread on my sandwich. And you want me to pay more for my french fries that I'm not going to get? It's going to be salad. And if you own a Dairy Queen, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just telling you. And in that moment, I think, I don't, I don't care. If I'm going to be a temple, I might as well be a mega church. Amen. Every home value goes up when it's got a wraparound porch. That's just the way it is. <laughs> but the Spirit of God has to remind me and says, self-control. Self-control. Now, you're going to go to the Dairy Queen this afternoon and just order the salad just to see if they charge you. And they do. But it's that way in every area of my life. When someone cuts me off in traffic, I want to scream and yell and... and and give them a thumbs up, but with a different finger. But the Spirit of God says you cannot let that stuff out. 
Because what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And so I have to ask God, Lord, bless them. Bless them with a wonderful police officer that will pull them over, give them a ticket, and teach them the meaning of obeying the authority that is over them. Now, I don't pray the right way, but I'm still trying, all right? It's a growing process. But friends, you cannot just claim to love God and then say, God, but I do not care what you want. The idea that God will just forgive you and save you and take you to heaven just because you have prayed a a prayer after a preacher is one of the greatest lies that Satan has convinced the church. Because when you truly get saved, the Spirit of God comes to live within you and He changes you completely. Now, it's a soul process. It's not a process that happens overnight. Salvation happens immediately, but sanctification will happen the rest of your life. You'll be 80 years old sitting there thinking something, and you'll be like, wait a second, I'm not supposed to be thinking that. Lord, forgive me. I'll be standing up here preaching, and something will come in my mind that shouldn't come in my mind, and I have to repent. But this morning the Bible says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And that's wonderful, but don't miss the rest of it. And his righteousness to children's children. If you want to bless your children, it's not about your bank account. It's not about how much land you own. It's not how much stuff you're going to leave them. It is to show them what to fear God means. To live for him, to love him, to serve him. I meet with people all the time that say, Jake, I took my kids to church. And I prayed the verse that if you train up a child in the way that they should go, when they are old, they shall not depart. Friends, it does not say that you took them to church. It says that you trained them. That means on Monday morning when you got up for work, that you were the same godly man you were while you sit on those pews. It means, moms, that you are the same godly person when you're sitting with your girls doing friends, whatever you do as a girl group, that you're not gossiping and slandering and backbiting, that you're training them up the same way you would in Sunday school that you do there. And let's be honest, that's where we start to see it. That's where we have to start saying, well, I didn't do that. But I wanted God to honor his part. God says he honors his part when we will fear him and his righteousness to children's children. And don't miss the verse 18. To such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. I want my children to accomplish whatever they set their hearts to. That's what I want for them. I want them to be the best underwater basket weaver in the whole world if that's what they want to be. That's what I want for them. But what I want for them more than anything is to see Jesus in me and to live it in such a way that my grandchildren can see Jesus in them and my great-grandchildren can see Jesus in them and that the destiny of my family for as long as God lingers and long as God tarries is a generation after generation that loves God, that serves Him, that honors him. And friends, that will not happen until this generation, to this group of families, until this church says, God, here we are, trusting you and giving you all the credit for everything. Pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. And God, I know today that it won't go well for certain people, certain belief, and certain ideas. But God, I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to trust that your Holy Spirit, God, is right now making Jesus the hope that someone has or the stumbling block. Today, Lord, I'm thankful that Jesus loved us and died for us and was buried and rose again and freely offers salvation to those who will believe. Today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be convicting hearts today. But God, I also know that when someone hardens their heart, you will let them. And God, at some point, you will even help them. And so God, today I pray, no matter what someone's beliefs are about politics or this country or whatever it is, God, whether conservative or liberal, that today, Lord, they would realize that you truly are the only answer. 
that your son is truly the only way. And today, God, I pray thankful for what you have been doing. And God, I am thankful, Lord, for every life that will be saved, even if it's just one. Lord, today I pray that you would help us to be a church, God, that lives out our faith in every area. Lord, that we would give a drink of water to that young child that's thirsty. Lord, that we would help families, help mothers. God, that we would be a church that doesn't just worship you with our mouth, but worships you with our actions. Father, today I pray that you'd forgive me if there's anything that I've said or done that came from my own flesh, my own emotions, my own desires. But Lord, do something great here today for your glory. Lord, I pray that you'd save that lost person, that man, woman, boy, or girl, that today would be the day. God, that family that's been praying about making this their church home, that today would be that day. Lord, for that person that's saved but never told anybody that's ready to be baptized, that today would be that day. God, for that family that's been living with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, that today would be the day they would commit to follow you completely. Or God, so many other things that only you can do. God, I give you all the praise and honor. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.